Anyway, I, as, before I get started in the message, what a, what a great time of worship. What a great time of worship that was. Thank you so much, Drew and Bethany. Um, I so appreciate the way God moves by his spirit. It's so awesome. A um, couple quick announcements I want to make pertaining to a couple things here. First of all, if uh, you haven't read the Eternal Blueprint yet, our, our Forerunner School is about to go through this class, the Eternal Blueprint, and we're going to be reading through this book and doing the teachings and stuff like that. But even if you're not part of the Forerunner School, I, I want to encourage, I want to invite you to join us. Even if you've heard it before, even if you, you know, you, you've got it, it's such a deep thing to really get from the head to the heart. And so what I have found is that when God gives an invitation like this, I mean, I felt led to share this. When, when God is moving in a sp uh, specific area like this, uh, it, it's important to respond in that season. So I just want to encourage you, if you haven't yet read this book, um, you can get it on Amazon. The link should be in the, in the YouTube section of the, the description. I want to encourage you to get that. I want to encourage you to read that through with us. We also will have a playlist on the YouTube link that will be the teaching we're going to go through. So I want to encourage you to go through that with us. Um, the other thing is, if you're not on our email list, email.radicalpursuit.net, the link is also will be in the little description. I want to encourage you to join up. I'm going to release a few articles that's going to go along with this teaching today that's going to be related to knowing God, uh, how to do it practically, because a lot of times people will be like, okay, what exactly do I need to do? I, I'm, I'm going to talk about knowing God today, but what exactly do I need to do? I, I get the idea that God's saying for me to know him, but when I get there, it's boring, I don't hear God speak, or, you know, what exactly do I need to do? This article is going to not deal so much in theology, but it's going to be a lot more practical. So I want to encourage you to sign up for that email list. So anyway, that said, if you have your Bibles, we're going to uh, continue in our series here uh, talking about a great reset in the church and the reset God wants to bring in the church. And so we've been looking a lot at Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 through 3. And so I want to invite you to turn in, the, in your Bible to Hosea chapter 6. And we'll start with re reading Hosea chapter 6. And uh, we'll launch into what we're going to talk about today, a great reset or a reset of pursuit. A reset of pursuit. And so Hosea is talking and he's speaking to Israel and I believe he would be speaking to us. And he says, come, let us return to the Lord for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. Verse three, I love this. So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. Hosea is telling us, he's inviting us into this incredible experience of knowing God intimately. Not knowing about him, not knowing data, not knowing Bible stories, Sunday school stories, not knowing scripture verses, and there's nothing wrong with that, but there's something so much deeper God wants to bring us into. It's an experiential knowledge of the person of Jesus Christ. God is inviting us to know him. God is inviting us into that experiential relationship with him. And I'm telling you, there's nothing greater than that. And Hosea says, let us press on. In other words, if you go down this path of wanting to know God, you are going to face obstacles, you're going to face trials, you're going to face warfare, you are going to face some things. I assure you, the devil wants to stop intimacy with God at all cost. So I'm telling you that not to scare you away, but to help you understand, okay, I'm going through this. You know, all of a sudden I've got interested in wanting to know about God and know God and get close to God and draw near to God and know him in the secret place. And all of a sudden everything that could go wrong is now going wrong. That's good news. It's good news. It means you are on the right track to God. 
Because the devil has limited resources, and he's only going to employ those resources to those he wants to stop. You know, if, if, God, if the devil is not attacking you, it probably means you're lukewarm. If you're not experiencing, I'm not saying you need to go out seeking spiritual warfare. <laughs> I'm not saying that at all. I don't wish that on anyone. But if you're not encountering spiritual warfare, attacks, it probably means you're lukewarm. It probably means you're stagnant in your pursuit of God because the devil comes to attack intimacy with God more than anything else. And Hosea says, you need to press on to know the Lord. Don't let distractions, don't let disappointments, don't let delay, don't let setbacks, don't let any of that hinder you from knowing God experientially, from knowing God internally. There is right now an invitation from the Lord, I believe with all my heart, and I'm going to talk about this sometime in the next few weeks or few months, but Jesus is, Revelation chapter 3, saying to the church at the end of the age, I, if you, I am knocking on the door of my church. If anyone hears my voice and opens, I will come into him and I will dine with him and he with me. There is a communing, conversational relationship and it's beautiful. I, I'm beginning to tap into this more and more and more. There's nothing like it. There is nothing like having this relationship with the Lord. I am addicted right now. It has been awesome. But it's not just for me. It's not just for you. It's for the entire body of Christ, the remnant church that is going hard after God. The Lord is inviting us into this dining, communion, fellowship, conversational relationship with God. I'm telling you, go for it. Go for it. Don't be passive. Go for it. And so Hosea is telling us, as we're looking at the great reset God wants to bring into the church, following all that we've been through in 2020 and 2021, the tearing and the wounding, God wants to bring us into an experiential relationship of knowing God, the depths of God. Deep calls unto deep. That is the cry of the Spirit of God right now, is he's saying to the church of Jesus Christ around the world, you're way too shallow. Step out into the deep. Step out into the deep, deep calls unto deep. And so as we talk about, as we talk about the great reset and the reset, reset of pursuit, I'm going to spend some time now talking about Philippians chapter 3. I believe that if you study this, I believe when Paul wrote Philippians chapter 3, I believe personally he was inspired by Hosea chapter 6, 1 through 3. Just even looking at some of the language where Hosea said, he's torn us, he will heal us, he will revive us after three days. Where Paul said I'm, that, I may, that I may experience his death and his resurrection, being conformed to his death so that I might attain to the resurrection from the dead. Hosea said, let us press on, let us press on to know the Lord. Paul said in Philippians 3, I press on towards the goal of the upper call of God in Jesus Christ. Hosea said, let us press on to know the Lord. Paul said that I may know him. I believe when Paul is, here he is in Roman prison under house arrest. And he's here sitting and he, and he writes what are called the prison epistles. Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, some of the most profound writings in history. And Paul is writing this and I believe he's inspired by Hosea. Let us press on to know the Lord. And the reason I titled this message Pursuit, a reset of pursuit, is because in the Hebrew, this word, let us press on, this word in the Hebrew, let us press on, means to run after, to run after, to chase, to follow after, to pursue. God wants us to pursue him 
even as he has pursued us. Think about that. If you're born again, it's because God chose you. If you're born again, it's because he saved you. If you're born again, it's because God has pursued you. Now God would then turn the tables and say, will you pursue me in the same way I have pursued you? This is a deep relationship. It's like the bride in the Song of Solomon. Draw me after you and we will run together. God is looking for God chasers. He's looking for those who would pursue God with everything they've got to chase after, to follow after, to pursue ardently God. And in fact, when Paul mentions press on in Philippians chapter 3, that Greek word really means the same thing as it does, this word means in the Hebrew. Press on, pursue, run hard after God. And I believe he's really challenging us right now as we come out of this tearing and wounding of 2020 and 2021 that we have been through, the Lord wants to really bring in a great reset to us. Like, if you think about it, we're going to look at Philippians chapter 3, but Paul was under house arrest in Rome. And when you read Philippians chapter 3, it really seems like Paul has had a great reset in his own personal life. Paul, at this time, had written much of the New Testament. Paul had planted numerous churches throughout the Roman Empire. Paul had been, you know, beaten. He had suffered for Christ immensely. He had been taken to heaven. He had seen the risen and glorified Jesus Christ, knocked him down on the ground. I mean, he had been there and done that, but now Paul is under house arrest in Rome, and being under house arrest is as if God is bringing into his life a great reset where Paul says, you know what? This is Paul speaking. Paul, just a few years before his death, Paul is basically saying, guys, I don't know him like I want to know him. I don't know God like I want to know him. That is not okay with me. I'm, I'm obviously paraphrasing. It's not okay with me where I'm at. Oh, I've got to have more of him. I've got to gain Christ. If there's anything, if there's any of the things of God that, that would come into my life, I've got to get rid of those things so that I can gain Christ and have more of Christ. Paul had a great reset. I believe we have been, in a sense, especially one year ago, one year ago from today, we were literally in a way, and under house arrest. And I believe that f coming out of this pandemic, God wants to bring a great reset, like he did in Paul when he was under house arrest, a great reset of, the, of what and who we are pursuing. See, let's ask some real questions here. Just really, what are we living for? Who are we living for? Think about it just for a second. What is the drive of your life? Is it to have a blessed family? Nothing wrong with that at all. Is it to have a nice house and beautiful things? Nothing wrong with that at all. Is it to have a successful career or ministry? You know, there's nothing, if that's in place in the right priority, nothing wrong with that. Is it to have a fun or adventurous life? You know, awesome vacations, travel, great friends, a blessed country. Your team win a championship. Well, okay, so if you live in Atlanta, that is never going to happen, so you might want to get that one off your list. So, listen, even after the NFL draft, I still don't have much hope the Falcons are ever going to win a championship. Anyway, I'll get depressed if I start going down that path. But listen, God is calling us to evaluate what and who we're living after, or we're chasing after. I believe if Paul was able to come into the church in the 21st century, the church in 2021, and he was to give us some counsel, okay, Paul, what would you tell the church coming out of this pandemic? What counsel would you give the church? What would you say the church should do coming out of this time of tearing and wounding and shaking, even knowing what's going to come in the days ahead, in the end times, and all that's coming and unfolding. I believe Paul would tell us, 
what he said in Philippians chapter 3. So if you have your Bibles, let's turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3 Paul lays out to me, it's one of my all-time favorite chapters. I believe Paul captures in Philippians chapter 3 the essence of what it means to be one who's following hard after God. I, I don't, I, I just, I love it. I love it. It's like Paul's come to the end of his life. And he's like, I've been there. I've done it. I have worked miracles. I mean, I have healed the sick. I have seen an extraordinary miracles. I have seen numerous come to saving knowledge. I've written so much of the New Testament. I have just, you know, I, I've been to heaven. I've seen all this stuff. But there's something at this point in my life. And obviously he didn't know he was about to, you know, a few years from his death. But he's, he knows he's, he's moving in that direction. Something apprehended Paul. And Paul's like, this is Paul. Not, not just, this is not something like me, something I said or someone else said. Paul is saying this. It's as if he says, I don't really know him. I'm only at the beginning of knowing God. The vast ocean that is the knowledge of God is endless. Its depths are unending. I'm telling you, I've only, this is, I'm saying Paul would say, I've only begun the depths of knowing him experientially. And so I think Paul would tell us, I think Paul would say several things to us. I've written down 11. So don't worry, I'm not going to cover all 11 today. I'm going to do five today. But the first thing I think Paul would tell us is if, if he was going to counsel us, if he was going to talk to us, is he would say, don't put your confidence in the flesh. Don't put your confidence in the flesh. And Paul talks about it in Philippians chapter 3. He says, we put no confidence in the flesh. Paul was basically saying, look, I was a who's who of Israel. You know, you may not understand it. You may not relate to it, but I was a Jew of Jews. I was a Hebrew of Hebrews. When it comes to the law, I was blameless. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin. When it comes to, the, to righteousness and, and zeal, I persecuted the church. I mean, I was moving up the ladder in the Jewish world. I was really becoming someone. And Paul was saying, you know, for me, what happened was that stuff, those things began to form in my soul a confidence in the flesh that I thought I was something to God because I had done these things, these Jewish things. And so before Paul encountered Christ, he was moving up that in the world of Judaism. But now Christ comes and appears to him and, and shines like the brightness of the sun, knocks Paul off of his horse, actually blinds him for a couple of days. And the blinding light of Jesus Christ comes and, and he has this incredible radical encounter with God and Paul's saying, from no longer, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to put any more confidence in the flesh. And I think Paul would tell us today, don't put confidence in the flesh. Even in America, even you Americans, you were putting confidence in your economic system. Well, what if, it, what if that economic system is shaken? You're putting confidence in your health care system. Well, what if that health care system is shaken? You're putting confidence in the blessing of God on your country. What if that's shaken? Don't put your confidence in the flesh. Don't take pride in your accomplishments. Don't take, see, Paul was, back then he was putting, he was putting a tremendous amount of pride in his own accomplishments, and he was saying, I have achieved these things for God. And Paul's saying, don't do that. Don't, don't take pride in your knowledge of the Bible. Don't take pride in your ability to in, uh, interpret Scripture. Don't take pride in your ability to quote Scripture. Don't take pride in your gifts or your talents or your money or your resources or the way God has blessed you. Don't put confidence in any of that because when you put confidence in the flesh, it does this dynamic in your soul called pride, and that pride blocks you from receiving more of Jesus Christ. And so Paul would tell us, 
Don't put confidence in the flesh. Second thing he would say, I believe. Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. He would say, whatever things, I want you to hear as we do this. As we read this verse of scripture, I want you to think about how often Paul uses the word things in this scripture. Verse 7 and 8. He says, but whatever things were gained to me, those things I have counted as loss for the sake of Christ. And he's talking about for the sake of gaining more of Christ. More than that, I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but rubbish so that I may gain Christ. It's very clear when Paul's writing here, he's wanting to address things. See, if we want a deeper experience of Christ, if we want to know Christ in a deeper way, there are things that would block us, things that would hinder us, things that would distract us. And Paul is telling us here and under house arrest, Paul is telling us, listen, I've lost all things. Even my identity as a, as a zealous Jewish person following the law wholeheartedly, I've even lost that pride. But I'm telling you, there has been nothing better than that. Because when I suffer the loss of things, I gain Christ. And he's far superior, far better. See, what things in your life are blocking you from gaining more of Christ? What things are they? Work, sleep, family, Fixing your house up. I mean, I don't know. The list is endless. Vacations. I'm not, there's nothing wrong with any of that. But Paul is wanting to hit on things. What things are there that are hindering you from gaining more of Christ? And Paul's telling us, it, again, it doesn't mean you've got to like sell your house and move into the wilderness. That's not what Paul's saying. That's what the Lord, what the Lord is saying. But those things that block you, those things that hinder you, Paul is saying, I have suffered the loss of those things, and I'm telling you, Christ is of infinitely greater value than those things. And what's interesting, too, is Paul here, having lived and experienced so much, I mean, you would think Paul had arrived, but Paul is actually telling us, I can gain more of Christ. Paul is saying this, Year, a couple years before his death, I can gain more of Christ. You, and he would say to us, you, me, we can gain more of Christ. We don't have to have the measure of Christ that we currently have. Are you satisfied with the measure of Christ that you currently have? Or do you hunger for more? Do you hunger for more of him? Do you thirst to know him Deeply. Do you hunger and thirst? Is there a pursuit within you for Christ? Is there a desire to go deeper in him? Because the depths of God are unending. See, what things are there? Think about it. Just, just take, it, take inventory of your life. What things are you pursuing above your pursuit of Jesus Christ? What blessings are you chasing after above your relationship with Jesus Christ? What things are you running hard after to obtain more than having him and gaining him and knowing him and experiencing him in the secret place of intimacy? See, are you satisfied right now? Are you satisfied? Are you hungry? For more. Jesus looked at the lukewarm Laodiceans and he says, You are an abomination to me. He didn't use those words, but he basically said, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth. That lukewarmness, that self satisfaction, that 
I'm okay with where I'm at in my relationship with you. God, Jesus looked at him and said, you are blind and you're naked. I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. That's nauseating to me. See, are you satisfied right now in the, in the closeness of your walk with Jesus Christ? Or do you hunger for more? Do you thirst for more? See, Jesus said, Jesus said, talking about the salvation of the soul, he said, he said that, you know, there is a man that he gains the whole world, but he forfeits his soul. Paul is actually taking that very same concept here and he's saying, I want to lose those things of the world that, uh, that my soul want to be attached to. And, and again, that doesn't mean you have to get rid of things. It means that soulish attachment to things. I, 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 Paul's saying, I want to lay down the things so that I can gain more of Christ. So that my soul can come into that transformation that God wants to bring, so that he might conform me into the image of his son. Third thing that, that uh, the Lord would, or the Paul spoke to us here in Philippians chapter 3, is he said, knowing Christ, or I'm, gonna, I, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but knowing Christ intimately is superior to everything and everyone else. See, if, if this message sounds like, oh gosh, this sounds so boring, this sounds so confining, this is like not good news, this is, you know, oh, I mean, you're telling me I've got to give up, give up some things to know Christ? That really sounds boring. You know, I'm going to have to go pray more and read the Bible more. Those are boring. Well, Paul would tell us, guys, you have no idea of this man and who he is. You have no idea of his glory and his beauty like he wrote about in Colossians. He's the one who upholds everything. He is the creator he is majestic and beautiful. He is the one who upholds everything by the word of his power. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. And he dwells on the inside of you by his spirit. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Paul is telling us, if you think he's boring, you have no idea who this man is. I guarantee you, when John saw him on the Isle of Patmos, he was not thinking, okay, this is boring. I guarantee you, when Isaiah saw him in Isaiah chapter 6, he was not thinking, okay, this is really boring. I'd rather be watching Netflix right now. He was undone. So Paul is saying that if we want to move into this reset of pursuits to pursue Christ, we need a vision to know that Christ is superior to everything and everyone. This is not just some Sunday school teaching. This is not just some you know, thing we're doing because we got to fill up a Sunday. Christ is infinitely superior to anything and everyone. The problem is, is we lack vision to see him as he is. We only know him as Jesus of Nazareth. We don't know him like John saw him in Jesus of Revelation. He's not boring. There is an, there is an, in, in, there is an infinite depth of God there is an infinite depth of God that we need to come into. He is better than. Jesus is better than sports. Jesus, remind me of that in football season. Jesus is better than you having a good career or a blessed life. Jesus is better than you going and traveling around the world. Jesus is better than you having a successful, fruitful ministry. Jesus is better than you fill in the blank. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, guys, I have a revelation of this man, and this man, he is better than everything and everyone else. You can just feel Paul. You can feel the heart of Paul saying, I want you to know him. And I was thinking about this yesterday, just working out in the yard. I was thinking about, 
when I was in my 20s, I made a very determined decision that I'm going to make my life pursuit knowing God. Not knowing about him, but knowing him intimately. And I'm not saying for 20 plus years I've done that perfectly, far from it. But I, I can look back on that, that decision to say, I am going to make my entire life revolve around knowing God and I'm going to pursue the, the intimate knowledge of God. And, and as I was looking back, I was like, oh my goodness. I've made a lot of really dumb decisions. I mean, just talk to Angie. She'll give you a whole list of them. I've made so many dumb decisions. But I tell you, one of the wisest things I've ever chosen was to say, my number one pursuit in this life is to know him. And as I have made that, the folks, I'm telling you, he has not disappointed me. But I'm only beginning. I really, I'm like, I'm, I've been at this for 20 plus years. I'm only at the beginning of getting to know him. I feel like I hardly even know him. But I'm telling you, just in the little ways he has revealed himself in this pursuit, there is nothing, it, I'm telling you, it is far better than anything else, anyone else. Jesus is superior. This word that Paul uses in, in verse 8, he says, that I may I count all things to be lost in the view of the surpassing value, the superior treasure of knowing Christ Jesus. This word knowing in the Greek comes, it's not a knowledge that comes to the brain. It's not a knowledge that comes to the mind. It's not determined by intellect. It's not determined by information. It is, an, in the Greek, it means an experiential knowledge. It means coming to the knowledge of something that you gain by experience. It's like if you go and you, you, when you're in college, you're getting a lot of book knowledge in your head, but when you go and you work at your job, you're getting experiential knowledge, that com knowledge that comes out of experience, and the two are vastly different. And if you've been to college and compared to working, you know exactly what I'm talking about. This is kind of the same thing that this Greek word means is Paul is telling us, I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to know more facts about Jesus. I don't want to know more scripture verses about Jesus. I want to come into this internal holy of holies communion with him, spirit to spirit in my inner man, this internal communion of dining and fellowshipping and having a conversation with this man. As I, as I come into this, I come into this knowing that comes by experience. What is he like? What does he desire? What does he want? What breaks his heart? What moves his heart? What fills him with joy? What fills him with pleasure and what fills him with happiness? That's what Paul's saying here. I don't want to just give you some facts and some information. I want you to come into the experience of knowing him just like you would in any type of relationship, an experiential relationship, that, a knowledge that comes out of experience. See, here we are trying to relate to what Paul said. You know, when he talks about, you know, I've had all these Jewish accomplishments on my resume and I did this, I did that. You know, it doesn't really relate to us, but I started thinking about this and I, I wanted to apply it just kind of in a way to the church is because in the church, a lot of times we fall in love with the things of God. We fall in love with prayer. We fall in love with worship. Or we fall in love with the Bible. Or we fall in love with spiritual gifts. Or we fall in love with the church or the kingdom or whatever it would be. And I was thinking about this is I don't, I want to get to that place where I don't just, I don't love prayer, but I love Jesus and I love meditating on him, and I love having a conversation with him. I don't love worship, but I love Jesus, and I want to minister to him deeply. I don't love prophecy or spiritual gifts or healing, but I love Jesus, and I love when he pours out his spirit to release prophecy and healing and spiritual gifts so that Jesus would be glorified. I don't love going to a two-hour service we call church. Well, you're the pastor. <laughs> well, if all we're going to do is have a two-hour service we call the church, I don't love that. I love Jesus. And I love Jesus, who is the head of the church. 
And I love Jesus and I love his body. And I love it when the, the head and the body come together in a local gathering called the ecclesia. And as we come together, Jesus expresses his life in us, through us, independently. We minister to him as a body. We, we hear his voice. We hear what the Spirit of God is saying. We're filled with him and we're overflowing with his life. See, I don't love the kingdom. A lot of people in the church, they love the kingdom. I don't love the kingdom. I love the king of the kingdom. And I love when Jesus comes to conquer my heart. Sometimes I don't love it because he demands everything. He demands lordship in every area. He demands lordship in your thoughts, lordship in your way you speak, lordship in how you spend your time and your money. So I'm not going to say I always love when Jesus comes and establishes an internal rule in my heart. But I love the fruit afterwards. But I don't love the kingdom. I love the king. I love when he comes and conquers and sets up his rule and reign in my heart. And when he establishes his rule and reign in the people that he governs over. There's a lot of people in the church, they love revival. All they talk about is revival, revival, revival. It's always about revival. I don't love revival. I love Jesus, who is the goal and the purpose of every revival. See what I'm saying? God wants to shift our focus off the things of God onto the God of all things. God wants to shift us from focusing upon this thing or that thing to focus upon this relationship with a person who lives inside of you by his spirit. You still with me? See, Paul would tell us, you charismatics, you think to know Christ, you have to have a trip to heaven. You have to have a dream or a vision. You have to have a trance. You have to have some kind of supernatural experience. Do you not realize Christ is already in you? Christ is in you. You don't need a trip to heaven to know Christ. You just merely need to turn inwardly to where Christ is. Well, that's new age. I don't want to do anything new age. It's only new age if Christ is not in you. If you're, not, you're not turning inwardly into yourself. You're turning inwardly into Christ who lives inside of you. Christ is closer to you than your skin if you're born again. You can have a holy of holy relationship with him all day, every day if you want it. You can abide in this continual conversation with God if you want it. That's how incredible it is. God, he's saying to us, I believe the Lord would be saying to us, or Paul would, be, would say to us, knowing Christ is not out there. Knowing Christ is not running to and fro and listening to this one and that one. Knowing Christ is internal. Knowing Christ is experiential. It's far more than, I'm not saying you get off track and outside the realm of Scripture, but knowing Christ is not just something that's, discerned and, or figured out and calculated by the reasoning of the mind, it is a spiritual reality, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit communion, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit fellowship, a spirit-to-spirit -spirit dining relationship with him. And so when, when things... God's not against things. God's against anything that hinders our relationship with him. So when things get in the way of our relationship with him, those things need to be laid down. Those things need to be surrendered if we want to gain Christ. Again, it, it, it sh I want you to just get a vision of this. The measure of Christ you currently have is not the measure of Christ God wants you to have. You can have so much more. You can have so much more. The increase of Christ is available to you. That's what Paul is saying to us. By your response, I'm not sure you are that happy about that.
Hello? Anyone there? You still there? Your, your level, the, the measure of Christ, listen to this, listen. The measure of Christ you currently have is the measure of Christ you want. If you've got a little bit of, if you have a little bit of Christ right now, in, internally, it's because that's what you want. You can have Christ in fullness. You can gain Christ internally. Are you, just really ask yourself this question, am I okay with the level of Christ I currently have? If you're okay with it, or if you don't do anything about it, it, it listen, you might say, no, I'm, I'm not okay with it. If you don't do anything about it, listen, you're okay with it. Because the, the measure of Christ, I just want you to get a vision of this. The measure of Christ we can have, I don't believe there's a limit to it. And I'm not saying we get glorified bodies right now, but I'm saying Paul at the end of his life, after all he did, after all he accomplished, realized there was more of Christ to gain. There was more of Christ to gain if Paul felt that way. I'm telling you, there's more of Christ you can gain. Are you okay with the measure of Christ that you currently have? Am I okay with the measure of Christ I currently have? Or is there inside of you a hunger? Is there inside of you a thirst? Is there inside of you this, even if it's small, don't discount the smallness of a little desire here, a little thirst here. Cultivate that because once you act upon that hunger and that thirst, once you act upon that, it's like when you normally eat. You, you eat something and then a couple hours later, you want more unless you had bad food. But, you know, so just... Listen, the more you have of Christ, the more hungry you are for more of him. That little taste, that little touch. Don't let things come in and cause your hunger for God to be quenched. That's the thing about the, the American church right now is we're allowing things to come in and fill us and satisfy us. And Jesus said that's lukewarm. And he had some unpleasant things to say about lukewarmness. I don't believe we can come in to this internal communing, dining re relationship with Christ when we are satisfied at our present level. Let God probe inside of you and shine light inside of you to expose those places inside of you where you said, I've had enough, I'm good. You would never use those words. I would never use those words. But there's more of Christ we can have. There's more of Christ. See, number four, I'm going to talk about poop here. So the kids probably would be very interested now if they were in here. But Paul said, knowing Christ makes everything else like poop in comparison. So if you have kids and you really, what the, what do you, I'm sure your kids are not going to ask, what do you talk about? But you can bring it up. Hey, guess what, guess what was talked about today? He talked about poop. And I guarantee you, your kids, if they're young, will be like, oh, he talked about poop. What, tell me what he said. And you can say, knowing Christ is infinitely better than, or knowing Christ makes everything else like poop in comparison. So I'm going to do that with Anna and be like, guess what I talked about today? She's like, ah, oh, it's so boring. I don't care. What, yeah, it's so boring. I talked about poop. Really? You talked about poop in your message? Yeah, I talked about poop. Paul talked about poop. Paul said, knowing Christ, knowing Christ makes everything else like poop in comparison. Horse manure, dung, stinky, poopy. Sorry. At least I'll spare you the other not-so-choice words. But Paul was looking back and he's saying, all of these things, he said... Let me actually read it here. Philippians chapter 3, verse 8. He says, 
I count all things to be lost in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and I count him but rubbish. In other words, we would look at Paul and go, oh, Paul, you've lost so much. I mean, you're in jail. You have nothing. You've lost all earthly possessions, and here you are. You have nothing in Christ. Paul's like, no, I have Christ, and he is everything. He said, all the other stuff you're feeling sorry for me for, I look at it, and you look like you need those things. You miss this thing or that thing or that thing. And Paul's like, it's rubbish. It's dung. It's horse manure. Because I've seen a vision of Christ and I'm ruined forever because of the person that I've fallen madly in love with. Again, I'm not saying you got to go get rid of your things. God has, I don't think God cares if we have things. God cares if things have us. That's where he gets his jealousy comes into the picture. Is when his jealousy is kindled is because things have our heart. Things have a grip on our heart. We like things more than we like Christ. And, and, Paul's, and the Lord's saying through Paul, you've got to let go of some things if you want to gain Christ. Number five, let's uh, turn to Philippians chapter 3 verse 9. Paul was still unpacking for us what's this incredible thing out of Philippians chapter 3. And Paul's saying that, that I may be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own derived from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which comes from God on the basis of faith. Number five is this. If we want to come into a deeper experiential pursuit and relationship with Jesus Christ, we've got to lay down our natural impulse to do, to do things to gain God's love, acceptance, and favor. See, all of us have this thing we've inherited from Adam that we want to go out and we want to go and we want to do. See, we want to go do something so God will like me more. We want to go do something so God will be pleased with me. We want to go do something so we might gain his favor. We want to go do something for God. And Paul is saying, listen, if you really want that internal experiential relationship with Jesus Christ to know him, then you've got to lay down that natural impulse that is within you to go out and do things for God. Now, that doesn't mean... You won't do things for God. You will. But it will come out not out of the soul, not out of striving, not out of working, not out of sweating, not out of this emotional frenzy. I've got to go do something for God so he'll like me. It comes out of intimacy. It comes out of a, a deep place of knowing that this is what the Lord said. Jesus only did what he heard his father say and do. So God wants to bring us into that place where we only do and hear what, the, what we only do what the Father says do, and that comes out of intimacy. When I was studying this week, thinking about this message, it just uh, it, it, it was astonishing to me that Paul, at the end of his life, still was undone by this idea of justification by faith. We've got this idea that, well, the more mature we become, the more, the more Christ-like we become, the more of his life that we possess, the more of his life that's living instead of our living, then justification by faith, that's really for the beginners who, who really are struggling and, you know, they need a lot of forgiveness and they need a lot of confession, they need the blood of Jesus to kind of continually wash them. But Paul is saying, no, no. Justification by faith is the bedrock, the foundation of everything you will ever do in Christ. Some people, listen, some people will move into holiness and move into this life of consecration and internal readiness. And we, we can't ever get, we can't move into that without being firmly planted in this idea of justification by faith. Not by what we do. See, justification means that God pronounces over you not just that you're innocent, not just that your sins are forgiven, but God pronounces over you a judicial announcement that you are righteous in the entire matter for which you were accused. How incredible is that? 
It's by faith. It's by faith. Faith in what Christ has done for us on the cross. Faith in what the finished work of the cross. Faith in what Jesus accomplished for us results in this declaration from the judge who says you are righteous in that matter. Your righteousness does not come by human effort. It comes by believing what Jesus Christ did for you and then having his spirit form that very thing inside of you. And so see, if, if we're going to really come into this experiential relationship with Jesus Christ, every bit of legalism has to be get, given and getting out of our getting has to be removed out of our life. Legalism, legalism will block you from that intimacy with Jesus Christ. That's what Paul confronted in the book of Galatians. When Paul said, having a righteousness of my own, not derived from the law, he was really talking about legalism. He's saying, listen, if legalism is working in my life, then I cannot know Christ. If legalism is working in my life, then I cannot have this intimacy with Christ. See, for, you know, 20, in, in the first century, legalism sounded more, a lot more Jewish than it does today. It would sound something like this. To be right with God, you've got to obey all the 613 commandments in the Mosaic law. You've got to be circumcised. You've got to keep the feast. You've got to eat, the, you've got to eat a certain way. You, you know, if you break one of these commandments, you have broken the entire law. Now, none of us, for the, I mean, none of us struggle with that type of legalism, but our legalism would be in the form of 21st century legalism that is... If, if you want to love God, if you, if, or if you want God to like you, if you want God to love you, if you want God to approve you, if you want Him to accept you, then you've got to pray this much, you've got to fast this much, you've got to read your Bible this much, you've got to witness, you've got to go on mission trips, you've got to give your money, you've got to do these things, these things, these things. That's, that's the legalism we would struggle with. But, but Paul would say, it's not Jesus plus prayer it's not Jesus plus fasting. It's not Jesus plus Bible reading. It's not Jesus plus giving. Now, that doesn't mean we don't do those things. We do do those things. But we do them out of this firm realization that we are righteous whether we do them or not. We are declared righteous whether we take part in an activity. See what I'm saying? The activity, the obedience comes after this receiving of my justification, this receiving that I am righteous in Christ. Make sense? See, <clears throat> justification is by faith alone, by grace alone, by Christ alone. It precedes any good works you will ever do. Yeah, but I know, we, we, we learned that years ago. Paul's saying, listen, I'm at the end of my journey. I've done all these things. You don't ever graduate from justification by faith. You don't ever move away from this doctrine. It's beautiful. It's not Christ plus prayer, Christ plus fasting, Christ plus Bible reading. It's Christ alone, through grace alone, by faith alone. See, justification is not based upon obedience to God's commandments. No amount of commandment keeping can ever make us right with God. Justification is by grace alone, through faith alone. We do not achieve justification. We receive justification. The law, it condemns the, the best of us, but grace saves the worst of us. Some of us need to be delivered from our legalism if we want to know Christ. We need to come into this place where God says, you are the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ where we understand that we are accepted in the beloved because of what Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross, not by our teeth-gritting obedience. Not to, that does not mean we don't have... Play, obedience is vital. Don't get me wrong what I'm saying. But if we don't have justification first and a revelation of justification first, we're going to strive and struggle and sweat to gain God's approval when God is saying to you, you already have my approval in Jesus Christ. We're going to do things for love instead of from love. We're going to do things for acceptance instead of from acceptance. We're going to do things for righteousness instead of from righteousness. 
I'm telling you, well, it doesn't seem like that's big a deal. It's a huge, huge deal. There is a vast difference between obeying God before faith and obeying God from faith. See, when we try to obey God out of this desire to please him, be accepted by him, gain his approval, I don't think he likes me, I need to go do this, this, and this, this legalism, Paul is telling us it nullifies the grace of God, it cuts you off from the grace of God, it hinders this intimacy you're searching after. But on the other hand, if your obedience flows out of this understanding that I am the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ, he declares that I'm righteous, he says that you are justified, he says that you are accepted and loved and, and favored and approved already, then what I do then flows out of those things of, of knowing his love, feeling his love, experiencing the approval of God in the secret place. See, in Ezekiel 44, Ezekiel said that the priest who are going to minister to the Lord in the Holy of Holies, they can't wear a garment that makes them sweat. I think the church in the 21st century should hear that because if we want to approach God, we cannot approach him on the basis of what we've done. It doesn't matter how many people we've led to Christ. It doesn't matter how many books we've written. It doesn't matter how much scripture knowledge we know. We cannot enter the holy of holies of God's presence by that which makes us sweat. We have to take off the garments of wool, which is the efforts of man to produce something for God. And we've got to put on the fine linen of the priestly bride that says that this covering that I walk in is the righteousness of God imputed to me by the finished work of the cross. You cannot approach God based on what you have done or have not done. Listen, you cannot let what you have failed to do hinder you from your relationship. There is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. I'm not, I'm not excusing sin, obviously. I'm saying that condemnation can weigh us down. Well, I haven't fasted enough. I haven't prayed enough. I haven't read enough. I haven't done this or haven't done that. God wants to deliver you from that so that you approach him not by this wool garment that makes you sweat. You approach him with the fine linen that is given to you by the Holy Spirit and what Jesus accomplished for you on the cross. Is that the alarm to stop? I think we will stop. I think that's God saying, you said enough, honestly. So we'll end it this way. Who, who was that? Raise your hand. That's good. Okay, awesome. Awesome. I think that is a good place to stop. So I'll end it here. God is bringing about a great reset of pursuit. He really wants us to examine deeply what we're living for and who we are living for. And he wants us to be a people who will, like Paul, be a people of one thing, who will center our entire lives around this relationship of knowing Christ. I want to tell you, if you will pursue Christ... He will teach you and show you and speak to you. I'm, he's not going to speak to you the way he speaks to me. He's not going to speak to you the way he speaks to dad or Angie or whoever else. We're all unique. He's going to teach you and train you to do it the way that works best for you, the way he wants you to do it. But I'm saying if you will implement these five things into your life, not put confidence in the flesh, realize that Jesus is better than anyone and everything. He's superior. Not placing, not allowing legalism to block you from your relationship with him. Not, you know, realizing that he's, a, he's greater than everything else and everything else compared to him is like poop. Um, that we've got to let go of things in order to gain Christ. That there is more of Christ to gain. See, if you will come into that realization and that revelation and you will pursue him with everything you've got, you will discover what Paul said and you will realize Jesus really is better than. And you can fill in the blank. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, I ask you right now, 
Lord, I ask you right now that uh, you would stir up our hearts. I think, Lord, I had, had, had not even thought about using that phrase. Is the measure of Christ that we have is the measure of Christ we want? I need to remember that. Remind me, Lord. Someone text that to me, maybe. The measure of Christ we have is the measure of Christ we want. Lord, let that be a sword. It convicts me. Lord, let that be a sword that pierces our own heart and soul, that exposes our lukewarmness. Lord, would you move in our lives and stir afresh Lord, would you move in our lives to stir afresh a hunger inside of us that is unlike anything we've ever had before. Let us become so hungry and so thirsty for Jesus Christ, for a relationship with him, Lord. Lord, would you show us the things we need to let go of to gain Christ? Would you show us what is blocking and hindering even the excuses that we make so that we could gain Christ? Lord, would you bring us into this dining, communing relationship with you? It really, you really are better than everyone and everything else. Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we love you. Amen. Amen.